Well, good morning, church. Welcome to all of our RLC families and guests with us this morning. We're so happy you've joined us today. My name is Taylor Yerrick, and I am one of the Quest Youth Leaders next door. Uh, My wife, Shelby, and my son, Levi, are home today with a cough, so um, be sending them nice thoughts. But we're happy that each one of you are here, and we are hoping that you are also healthy in whatever you might be doing this morning. Good morning, guys. Love you. Um, If you are home watching online, thank you for being safe, and we hope to see you in person soon. If you're here for the first time, we're so glad that you've joined us. Um, If you could fill out the form in your welcome brochure, hold on. You get to have these now and pass them out. It's exciting. Um, It's in this part right here. So if you could fill it out and pass it in um, at some point. If you walk in through the doors and take a quick right, there's a kind of a welcome center that's there. Um, That's where you can drop that off. So all of you guests who are with us today, thank you. Um, If anyone also needs a prayer request, there's a form in the brochure, again, for you and your prayer needs. Um, Again, drop that off in either one of the offering stands or uh, to an usher, or again, take it to the Welcome Center. This morning, I get to give a birthday shout out to two ladies. The first is Julie Brody, and I did lay eyes on, there she is. Woo! Wait, wait, am I wrong? Where was she? Oh, that side, sorry. I totally thought you were over there. What is wrong with me? (sighs) <sighs> Sorry. Julie, good morning. Because you're here, you get a song, so just hang on for 30 seconds. Also, um, it's Mama Bird's birthday. That's my mother-in-law's birthday um, this morning, and I'm hoping that she's online. So, hi, Mom Bird. Happy birthday. So here's your, here's your and, and the odds of this happening, that the son-in-law gets to be, so I get to, like, milk it for all it's worth right now. Here we go. This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. That's it. That's all I got. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right, let's get on to some announcements. Digital announcements are available on our Facebook, Twitter, and church app. Remember that the December calendar is on the church app and the RLC website. God was going to make me laugh up here if I keep doing this. Also, remember that our services can be located on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Um, The Word for You Today devotionals are in the Welcome Center. I just picked up mine because I hadn't gotten mine yet. Um, Again, there's one per household. If you go straight through the doors, quick right is where you're going to be picking that up. Um, Everyone is welcome to get other copies for a small donation as well. Last announcement, and that is that Christmas is coming. All right. I was a little nervous, but well done. Thank you again um, for that response. Yes, Christmas is coming. And so there's a couple of things that we're preparing for. Number one is that the Quest Youth Group will be recording um, after second service on the 12th of December. And the same thing with Res Kids, but they'll be on the 19th after second service. So just as a heads up, if you need to go see Jeremy or Miss Lynn for more details, please make sure that you reach out. Um, And we're going to conclude this morning with tithes and offerings. If you're new, please don't feel obligated to give. Just filling out that information and just you being here is a gift to us. Um, To everyone else, thank you again for your continued giving and your generosity. There are lots of ways to give, whether it be that you're um, mailing them in or at the giving stations over by the exits or online through the website or through the church app. Um, However, thank you again so much. And my encouraging scripture is also tied into tithes and offerings. And again, it's the message you just heard about Christmas coming. And if you ask a youth, what does it mean if Christmas is coming? A youth is going to say that means presents, right? And of course, that's the same for kids as well, but like, that's what all the kiddos get excited about is, now, I know, I'm a science teacher, you got to follow my logic here, just, just for a minute. Do those presents just like, appear under the, tr- no, parents, you guys, you went out there, you got those presents for them, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when you love, me being a new dad, you know, I, I forgot a dad joke today, sorry. Um, but me being a new dad, right, I love my son, I want to give him gifts, right? When you love, you give. When you love, you give. And so when you think about John 3.16, like, which is you know, hopefully a verse that's near and dear to all of your hearts, you think about that verse that says, For God so loved the world that he gave, right? Loving leads to giving. So could you please stand on your feet? Um, We're going to worship this morning for that exact reason, because Jesus loved me so much. God loved me so much that he gave his son instead of me. Wow. Anyways, let's praise and worship the Lord together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what 
what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you've conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. And hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. And hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, he the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have done great
created us to be. So we praise God this morning. Well, we want to dismiss, if there's any children, we want to dismiss six, thir- three years to sixth grade to the children's wing and seventh to twelve to the youth wing. Praise the Lord. The rest of us can wave or go and greet somebody. Pastor Jeff is doing better every day. Thank you, Lord. He is resting and restoring his strength. So we thank the Lord for that. Um, My name is Judy Alvarez, an elder of this church. And in a little more than a year, we'll have been married to Pastor Gay for 50 years. Praise the Lord. I want to uh, welcome all those who are viewing online. Thank you so much 
for tuning in, and we all will be blessed together. Uh, this morning, and I forgot to say it, but I was so blessed because Kalani, my granddaughter, is serving in the children's wing today, and she told her mom that she wanted to get up really early because she wanted to be here in person to support her grandma. Isn't that sweet? We love you, Kalani. So, the subject of waiting. This has always been a focus of conversation, a topic that prompts many opinions. Some say, life is short, buy the dress. <laughs> Others think, good things take time. In our days, whether it's in sports or work, studies or travel, plans or dreams, the words delay, stop, halt, cancel, all those words have crowded our lives. Last Sunday, we talked about the discipline of waiting, one of the most challenging calls of Scripture and of life itself. The question posed was, how are we waiting? We examined the difference between immediate responses to needs or wants versus learning how to wait, and very importantly, about gaining strength as we wait on the Lord. We regarded your life and my life as a rope interwoven with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Remembering this scripture that says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And I love when I see that rope, I feel just so snug there, snuggled with the Lord, right? Beautiful uh, picture of being woven with the Trinity. It's a solid and resilient union. Then we looked at how our lives are further strengthened by intertwining many other necessary strands, uh, which are spiritual disciplines, mindsets, and attitudes, such as faith, hope, patience, nourishing on the word, can't not do that. Seeking Jesus through time and prayer. Coming together for worship service is so important, whether here in person or online. Having fellowship with the body of Christ, that is such a blessing. Accountability, Woo, it's a big one. Having somebody that you are accountable to. Uh, other things like being a witness. We have to always speak of our faith in Jesus. And a big one, big on God's heart, serving others. Service makes us grow. We gain such supernatural strength from God when we have all these strands in the rope of our life. Strength to resist what wants to tear us down. To stay strong, to stay unbroken in battles. To fight back when it seems we are sinking. To overcome, to stand tall. And very importantly, to stand still. Right? Now... This is a picture of lives that are in position, in the right position, surrendered and intertwined with God. No matter how the skies are, right? We can be in position every single day. Another significant concept considered last week was the difference between waiting passively versus waiting actively. 
we concluded biblical waiting is not a passive activity. Never. But it is displayed by active dependence on and trust in the Lord. Active dependence on and trust in the Lord in God. Joyce Meyer states that there is a misunderstanding about what it means to wait on God. She says it is certainly not a non-active time of doing nothing while your life is put on hold. Never that. Waiting is actually an action word, right? So we are called to be very active spiritually during our waiting time. Not that? Very active sp spiritually during our waiting time. And I see that as a delightfully powerful contradiction. Praise the Lord. So we see here that our ABCs, right? Actively waiting. Our ABCs never change. Don't leave anyone out. We have our praying. We have our praising. We have our getting into the Word of God. And we have our union, our fellowship with the body. Praise the Lord. So, ABCs, keep them always in your life. I'd like to share uh, a vivid description of waiting behaviors, okay? Observed by a doctor's wife while she was working in his practice. She states that waiting for the doctor is an art form. I think we can all agree. So first, she refers to the sleepers, saying, some even snore. Then they are the eyeball rollers. Every time a patient that's not them is called. Two other groups which express similar unhappiness are the, <sighs> the sires, and the hmm, which she calls hmm furs. You know? There are also those unprepared parents, my heart goes out to the parents, who forget to bring a single thing to keep their children occupied. So the restlessness of the little ones triggers some disgruntlement in the others. And finally, she says, lo and behold, there are a smart group of patients who came prepared to wait. Sometimes a smaller group. So I saw some nods and a few looks to one another. So I'm gathering that here we do have some eyeball rollers, some sires, some humphers sitting right here. I am guilty. I am guilty. We did establish that waiting is one of the most demanding activities, especially because of our I need it now mentality. We tend to think this way both in our earthly endeavors and in our spiritual ones. Yet, life will constantly give us lessons on the reality of hurry up and wait. We know that one, right? All of us do. We all have issues and complications, and problems, and concerns. We are asking God to help us with, and to give us wisdom about. It's almost like we're all in a big waiting room. The most wonderful results of waiting on God would be lost, though, if we remove ourselves from God's waiting room. If we remove ourselves. The thing is that as God allows you to wait, he is also making you who you must become. Making me who I most must become in God's waiting room. He's working out the answers. Even if or despite the fact we may know very few or none 
of the details. But one thing is certain. Before God moves suddenly, we will wait. Nobody gets out of it. So the question is not if we will wait, but rather how we will wait. And I believe that how we wait determines how long we do so. How we wait determines how we do so. Pressing the pause button, one of God's tools for developing his children. We learn some of life's greatest lessons through the ability to resist the desire for an immediate reward. That's the I want it now. Resist the desire for an immediate reward in hopes of obtaining a more valuable and long-lasting long -lasting reward, which is God's will be done. That comes in the long term. I really believe that God is just as interested in our journey in life as he is in the destination. That's why biblical accounts include not only the wonderful, great victories, which we all love to read, but also the good, the bad, and the ugly of the times of waiting. When we read those, it's like, why did God allow that to happen? Or better yet, why is that even recorded in the Bible? Well, God has nothing to hide. He is sovereign in the midst of it all. He knows the end from the beginning. And he is always good, even if we can't grasp what's going on. And we may never understand why we have to wait, but this is the good news. Here are the good news. God never asks us to wait without him. Flash, good news. God never asks us to wait without him. That is awesome. As God allows you to pause, remember, there is actually something happen while nothing is happening, or so we think, right? God uses waiting to change us. Isn't that awesome? God uses waiting to change us. And again, he is making us become what we must become. So why is waiting on God a fundamental factor for becoming who God has purposed us to be? Well, in God's waiting room, Holy Spirit is operating a transformation in those who submit to the process, okay? So, Holy Spirit is always working. Are we submitting to the process? Keep in mind, we said this last week, waiting on God and surrendering to the work of Holy Spirit is never, never, never wasted time. Never. I'm always reassured that God never wastes a tough season we go through or hurts we experience. So when we surrender to his process, during which his plan for us is completed, mighty things happen in us and for us. Holy Spirit is always laboring effectively within God's children to conform them into the image of Christ. Now, there is a valuable and long-lasting reward, praise God. But only according to his time, then we can experience his very best. Now, I'd like to consider this morning a number of whys, if you will, whys, for this confident expectation in God. First, 
Sometimes we're not ready for the next phase. Not ready. God has plans for us, but there are instances when he stops us in our tracks until we do a little internal house cleaning. Some internal house cleaning. Maybe we may have been tolerating a sin in our life. Could that be the reason? Or maybe we need to deal with some bad attitudes. Could that be the deal? Or maybe we have some very ungodly thought patterns that keep us stuck. The Lord has places to take us, and he knows exactly what baggage needs to be left behind. So in God's waiting room, we must take time. We must take time to search our hearts so he can help us see what needs to be confessed, what needs to be forgiven, what needs to be renewed. Psalm 51 is a prayer of repentance. And a couple of times, maybe three, four times a year, I have to sit with this psalm before the Lord. Now, these are not all the verses, and they're not even in, uh, in order. But that's the way I wanted to read them today. First, have mercy upon me, O God, for I acknowledge my transgressions. It always starts with admitting with acknowledging there's sin, there's a problem, something's not right. So we ask God's mercy and we say, I know this is happening. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. God loves honesty, that we can be honest. He knows what's going on, but he likes it when we're transparent in his presence and we can say, okay, God, your Holy Spirit, I Help me, I put the finger on it. This is what's happening. So we are honest. We say the truth to the Lord, and he starts making us know wisdom about what's going on, and then also about what he wants to go on in our lives. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, oh God, you will not despise. That is the basic thing God wants from you, right? Surrendered in his presence, your face on the ground. Now, these two posters here went right into my lesson because it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So that's happening, right? You're confessing, you're acknowledging, you're being honest, you're opening up. Your heart is broken before the Lord. And then we say, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then starts the results of this time we have had with the Lord. Then, okay, then I will teach transgressors your ways. I am ready, Lord. I've done this cleaning, I've recognized, I've asked for forgiveness, I've, I've come to you in a broken spirit, then I will treat transgressors your way. So a vessel ready for the mission has been allowing Holy Spirit to work from the inside out. Never perfection, we don't have perfection in this life, but always humility, a teachable spirit, and complete willingness. These three things will propel you for the next step. Also, the delay could be for the purpose of training us for his calling. David was anointed king when he was a young man, but he spent many years in the wilderness 
And in the book of Psalms, we read about his cries out to God, his sleepless nights, and the fierceness of those who persecuted him. He was humbled in distress, but he never lost hope. Through all of this conflict, God prepared David's heart for his upcoming assignment and sharpened his leadership skills. He was going to need them. When the time was right, God brought him to the throne because when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. And those words are not only for David. Those words are for every single one of you sitting there here and listening online. When the time is right and we have submitted to the process, God will make it happen. Forget the notion that God doesn't see your struggle. Quite the contrary. God is fully engaged in equipping you and me for action. Trust his training. How we respond in our times of affliction has everything to do with the results we will see. Very important. Training. So in Hebrews, we have some awesome scriptures to the effect. My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines, and the child he embraces, he also corrects. We want to be that child, so we got to go through the training, right? At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off big time. So the payoff can't come before the discipline, right? For it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. Hallelujah. So don't sit around on your hands. No more dragging your feet. God said it, not me. Praise the Lord. So another reason is that waiting reveals our true motives. It's always wise to rest in the Lord because in doing so, he gets our attention and he sifts our motives. Waiting has a way of bringing out the best and the worst in people. Why do we really want that promotion? Do we want to get more money? So others will think we are so powerful, we're all that. Or could it be that we want that promotion to better meet the needs of our family and to have a greater platform to serve the Lord? If we allow God to sift through our motives, and sifting, you know, is sorting through, examining. Teresa does a lot of that with those houses that she puts ready to for everything to go to be sold. So it's examining. It's going through with a Holy Spirit fine-tooth comb. Mm. So everything, you know, we get it little by little, what's in there, what's in there. So when that happens, the truth will surface, good or bad. And it's surprising what we learn about ourselves during this waiting period. Jeremiah, the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle no one can figure out. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things, right? Going deep down. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. God is not putting down who we are in this scripture. God loves us completely. But he is letting us know that we don't even know our hearts. 
but he certainly does. So God is working for the truth to come out, not saying that we're hopeless. As Pastor Jeff always says, God cares for us and always receives us just as we are. But he loves us too much to let us stay as we are in the same condition, whether in the same condition we came to him or in the condition we have fallen in because of the trials and tribulations of life. So it's good to wait, listen, and learn. So we could pray for our own hearts. Perhaps our attention needs to be refocused, and that's why we wait. It's easy to become so absorbed in our own concerns that we may forget to include God in the equation of our lives, as Pastor Gabe frequently says. It happens, well, we are so busy. Not enough hours in the day for our overloaded schedules. Yet it happens that steps may have to be retaken and time lost when we are focused more on our to-do list than on the one who empowers us to do the list, God. Right? Right? So, let me give you a for instance. Dropping off materials at Gansevoort School for my grandson, Zaid, was the fourth item on a busy morning list. Checked it off, went on my way. His mom got a call later in the day about the odd materials in the bag, which were shampoo, rinse, and curling lotion. I had promptly and diligently handed over my hair products, which I had picked item three on the list. Next day, I had to do it all over again and meekly deliver the real school supplies. Also, a family member of mine, in a big rush, used the bank drive through carrier, thankful that it was a great way to save some time. Later, the bank called, stating that the drive through carrier tube was missing. <laughs> did she happen to have it? She did. Never even dawned on her while it was sitting right there in the passenger seat all day long. So, a day later, and some embarrassment later, back to the bank, she went. But I promise you that my family is sane most of the time. Yeah. So back to perhaps our attention needs to be refocused on Christ. Nothing grabs our attention like a difficult time in life. A situation that confuses us and knocks the wind right out of us. Suddenly, we put on the brakes. Hopefully, we put on the brakes and look upwards. Now, there's a difference between seeking the Lord for who he is and seeking the Lord for his interventions in our lives. If our thoughts are only on what we want him to do for us, we have missed the mark. Yes, we have missed the mark. Do we run to God as our errand boy to bring back the answers we need quickly? Or our Mr. Clean to quickly clean up our messes? Or our SOS service of immediate responses? Is that the way we approach God? Or do we reach out to the one who is the lifter of our head, who is our hope of glory, who is the lover of our soul. Is he worth glory and praise 
only when he does exactly what you want and think he should do. Hmm. Sitting in the Lord during challenging times is to fortify and build up our love relationship with him until our answer comes. Not simply to ask, just ask for our desired outcome. That's why this is such an amazing truth when we can tell the Lord, because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. How wonderful it is to let the Lord know that whatever's going on, whatever is falling around us, He still is our center. He still is our north. He still is our life. And His love is better than life. Hallelujah. Another thing that waiting does is that it transforms our character. Waiting has a way of rubbing off the rub edges of our lives. We know the story of Moses and remember him in the desert so many years before God came to him. God used this time of waiting for Moses to transform his character. As a young man, Moses was impulsive and impatient, killing a man thinking he had the right to deliver his own justice. They were his people. He felt something has to be done, and it has to be done right now. So he did it. He said, time to take action, right? Wrong. God had other plans with Moses first. So Moses ran for his life and was exiled to the desert. For nearly 40 years, he had another career, learning to lead sheep. Hmm. Very different, right? From being the man who was there to do justice. Learning to lead sheep. When he was given a second chance, he did it God's way. And in God's time, he became probably the biggest leader in the Old Testament. Because waiting is not just about what I get at the end of the wait, but about who I become as I wait. We've said it the third time, right? That's very important. Some seasons are like final exams, brutal, sudden pitfalls of stress, sickness, or sadness. Whew. And what's the purpose of the test? God is more interested in our character than in uncom our comfort. We don't like to hear that. God is more interested in our character than in our comfort. But when we come to understand this, waiting becomes more easy, easier, because we are, we understand. So James says, so let it grow. And don't try to squirm out of your problems. For when your patience is finally in full bloom, at least for that situation, right? Because patience has always been developed. When your patience is finally in full bloom, then you will be ready for anything. Strong in what? Character. Full and complete. God wants to develop character in us. So all of us have our own waiting room experiences Life care services and journey of recovery meetings are God-given provisions to help us learn how to wait well. In a life care group, there are people who will do life with you. Do life 
with you. There to love you, be there for you, when life comes at you fast. Many testimonies we have among us. Getting to the root of things, digging deep, is a very basic personal search in the journey, in journey of recovery. Digging deep for emotional healing. We all need emotional healing. Within these groups, you can do what we said at the beginning, active spiritual working while we wait. We can do that. You don't have to walk it out alone. Yet, you have to be available physically, in your emotions, and spiritually. Another one is that at time, at time the Lord's delays are designed to strengthen our faith. If he instantaneously gave us everything we wanted, we would never learn to walk by faith. In 1988, Pastor Gabe and I were ready to move our family from Ithaca to Rome. Uh, finances weren't great, but we understand that was the next move. And um, in the last semester of my last year in Cornell, there was a scholarship that was promised to me. And they told me this month it didn't come, this month didn't come, this month it didn't come. And finally, I was told that in any case they would mail it because it seemed that it was not going to get there. So a couple of days before we left, we were just checking to see what we had in terms of moving, you know, the monies. And we realized that we needed $1,000 to do, you know, when we rented the house, that first payment from the, the first month. And lo and behold, we opened the mail, and in, the che in there, that was the check of $1,000 for the scholarship. God came through. Now, 1988, you know, houses, you could get them for $500. <laughs> That's a story of the past. But that was so good because that money was really intended for our rent, never for anything else, any need we had while we were still in Ithaca. A disappointment reminds us that what we hoped would happen did not happen. We wanted health. We got disease. We wanted family. There was divorce. We wanted acceptance. We got rejection. Now what? Well, we could do what Miss Habersham did. I don't know if you remember her in Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. She closed all the blinds, stopped every clock, left the wedding cake on the table, and continued to wear her wedding dress until it hung in yellow decay around her. Her wounded heart consumed her life. But Jesus died and resurrected that we can have so much better. None of those actions are the ones we have to do when life disappoints us. It says, he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. That is what we could expect from God. That is what's going to happen in the midst of any disappointment, if you believe, if you trust, if you wait. Do you take your disappointments to God? You probably share them with relatives or your friends, or you just don't talk about them at all. But have you taken them to God? You must go to him. The good news that I gave you before, I'll give you again. God never asks us to wait without him. He will never let us do this alone. You didn't sign up for this 
crash course in single parenting, or in sudden unemployment, or an expected, unexpected health report. No, but God has taken the intended evil of the enemy and rewoven it into his curriculum. He has. Why? So at the right time, you can teach others what he has taught you through this somber, long, difficult experience. Rather than say, God, why? You can ask God, what? What? What can I learn from this experience? Rather than ask God to change your circumstances, you can ask him to use your circumstances to change you. That is God's purpose. So, it says in 2 Corinthians, in the message, God comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Praise the Lord. And last week I mentioned that that's what in one of the um, lessons, I would say, or reflections in Journey of Recovery, it's called recycling your pain. You know, you went through it, you can bless somebody else. You can tell them, I understand. I was there. He heals. He saves. He changes. He prospers. I know. And you can cry with that person. You can laugh with that person. And sometimes you may not even say anything to them, but you're just there because you know what it is. Hallelujah. Waiting means resting in God's timing. And still actively, actively taking care of responsibilities as a parent, a spouse, a student, an employee, a minister, a citizen. A delay is never a denial. You heard that? A delay is never a denial from God. Hallelujah. It's a time of preparing you, preparing me for the promise. Praise the Lord for the promise. As there was a promised land in the Old Testament, there's a promise for each of us. And as we wait, God prepares us. So allow God to set the pace for your life. Obey him. And he will honor you in due season. In due season. We read that in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, it won't be up here. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. We have a God that is seeing, that knows, that is attentive, that is working. Wow. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the sun. Life is a required course. Nobody can say, I'm not doing it. Life is a required course. So we might as well do our best to pass it. The good news, some more good news, you will get through this. And understanding all the possible whys we have discussed today, why the Lord hasn't yet answered that specific prayer or brought that specific relief or given you yet specific directions on what you're going to do, yet we can trust in his wisdom and in his timing. You know, we need to make the most of this season of life, no matter what you are going through, and entrust your dreams to the one who gave them to you. We have another two beautiful scriptures. My times are in 
your hands. The hands of the Lord are strong. They never let us fall. They hold us up. And whether the times goes very slow or faster than we think, my times are in your hand. He knows. He knows. He knows. He has made everything beautiful in its time. That is so promising, so full of hope. He has made everything beautiful in his time. It can be overwhelming during any kind of grief, and we all have them. Any kind of grief to comprehend how God can turn your pain, your distress, into something beautiful in his time. But you can, can, can trust in God's ability, in his faithfulness, and his power to do just that. So God takes his time. You'll see here, and these times can be approximate, but you get the the picture. Joseph waited 13 years. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited 40 years. Jesus waited before he started, right, his ministry, 30 years, right? And it doesn't mean that in every problem you have, you have to wait all these years. I don't know the time, but we all have to wait. And sometimes it's a short time, and sometimes it's a longer time. Yes, but look at that. If God is making you wait, you are in good, and I would say you're in great company. We all waited, but we will all succeed. How wonderful is that? So, how long is God taking with your particular waiting room circumstance? Think about it. How long is God taking with your particular waiting room circumstances? We fear that depression will never lift. The yelling will never stop. The pain will never leave. Life in the pit stinks. Yet for all its rottenness, it does force us to look upward. It does force us to look upward, if you will. Your pain won't last forever, but you will live to see God's answers. I would ask everybody now to bow their heads so we could just focus on a few things before we close. In God's waiting room, Romans 8.28 becomes your story. And I know this scripture is very common. We hear it here, we hear it there, and as I said about another scripture last week, sometimes it just... For us, it loses its its power, its relevance, but it is a powerful and relevant today scripture. It says, part of it, in everything, God works for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I'm going to ask you right there with your eyes closed to do this exercise, simple exercise. In your mind, remove the word everything from the scripture and replace it with the symbol of your pain, your dilemma, or your unresolved issue. You could say one or more than one. How would Romans 8.28 read in your life? For example, in hospital stays, God is working for my good because I love him. In divorce papers, God is working for my good because I love him. In negative health reports, God is working for my good because I love him. I don't know what yours is, but take a moment right now, and I will say in, and you fill the blank. Hallelujah. 
in whatever you fill the blank in, God is working for your good because you love him. Take the scripture home and do this frequently. Fill the blank, then trust and wait on the Lord. You know, God is good even when the outcome is not what you expected. But I promise you, the outcome is exactly what you needed. In due season, if you don't give up, he will show you his glory. Now, I'd like you to open your eyes so we can read the last scripture in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles. Now, this is Paul speaking, right? He was persecuted from inside the church, from out of the church. He was in in those uh, uh, shipwrecks. He was uh, hit with a whip. How many things did he not go through? But he says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Unseen because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Hallelujah. How wonderful that we're able to fix our sight on God's unseen things that become seen. So, again, I'd ask you to close your eyes because I want to talk to anybody that is either here or out there in their homes or wherever they're viewing the service. That is, this all starts, this all, these all blessings and, and expectations in God starts when we invite Jesus to come into our hearts as Lord and Savior. That may be you. He's the one who forgives your sins and gives you eternal life. So I'm asking you today if you would consider inviting him to be Lord and Savior, one who takes over every aspect of your life and made you a new creation. You know, one who is waiting on you right now to ask him in. So if there's anybody here and everybody continue with their eyes closed, Or online, I would ask at least the persons here that I could see if you would slip up your hand so we could pray with you and for you. Anybody this morning? We are going to pray the prayer just because we may have people online who have made, want to make that decision this morning. So I'd ask you all to pray with me. Father God, I need a Savior. Forgive my sins. Come into my life. Make me a new creation in you. I will walk with you in this new life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. We clap because if someone read this prayer, well, all heaven is rejoicing, and so are we right here. If anyone prayed this prayer, even if they were here and just didn't raise their hand, please let somebody know, let let an usher know, let uh, one of the elders know, because we want to rejoice with you and give you a little booklet about the step you took today. Those online, we would love to hear from you through our red website, reslifenewyork.org. We will pray for you, and if you want any communication from us, please leave some contact information on the site. So now we will pray to dismiss. So once again, I'd like you to close your eyes. Thank you, Father, because you know what we need. 
And you have spoken today to these needs, as you always do. Help us guard this word in our hearts so that we would hear from you and not sin against you. Help us not run away from your waiting room. Instead, that we would thank you and rest in you because you have a great purpose for each of us. And we want it fulfilled in our lives through the work of Holy Spirit. So we thank you for all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So you are dismissed. And like Pastor Jeff always says, next week is going to be the best week of your life. So live it out.